I'm going to ask uh, Chris and, and Bob to come up, and we're going to do our final panel of the day, uh, Emerging Federal Health Policy Opportunities. Before we begin the panel, um, I wanted to uh, throw out sort of an aspirational quote that I think really en encapsulates the work that we're doing on Capitol Hill, the work we're doing with CMS, and I think a lot of what we've heard today. And I'm going to uh, shamelessly embarrass uh, somebody in the room, Dr. Bud Hemmes, who is a national leader. I think we all know Bud's work, respecting choices uh, at Gunderson Health System in La Crosse, Wisconsin. The quote is this. Uh, Bud says, this approach, and he's referring to advanced care planning and advanced illness, uh, advanced illness care generally, this approach is person-centered. Medicine, from my perspective, is not the care of humans. It's the care of individual humans. We must tailor the treatment we provide in accordance and in respect of that individual's beliefs, values, and preferences. If we're not doing that, we're not fulfilling the full potential of medical care. I think a theme we've heard throughout the day, and, I, and certainly a theme uh, that CTAC is focused on when we're talking to legislators and talking to CMS is, how do we design a healthcare system that's responsive to a person's goals, values, and wishes? Period, full stop. Um, it's been mentioned this morning that the current fee-for-service system, for example, uh, is really geared more toward volume rather than value. And as we shift away from a fee-for-service system, we really want to be focused on how do we ensure that the healthcare system is always responsive to what people want when they become seriously ill. So with that, um, I'm delighted to, to be here today with uh, two national leaders um, who, who really changed the lives of, of thousands of Americans fa with facing serious illness on a daily basis. Uh, my good friend, uh, Bob Swislow. Bob Swislow is the Government Affairs Officer at U.S. Medical Management, a leading healthcare provider of uh, home-based healthcare services, uh, especially for those uh, high acuity patients, uh, and also uh, Dr. Chris Smith. Uh, Chris is uh, Vice President and Medical Director at Northwell Health Solutions and also Senior Vice President for Population Health Management at Northwell Health. Uh, importantly, uh, both USMM and Northwell are leading members uh, of the Coalition to Transform Advanced Care and we're thrilled to have you both uh, with us today. So with that, I'd like to turn it to you, Chris, for your remarks. Great. Well, thank you for having me. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to take a slightly different approach um, with my, my remarks for the next 10 minutes. Um, I want to give you a little bit of perspective um, and some thoughts on some of the tensions that need to be resolved if we want to move this work forward. So I work for a very large integrated delivery system in New York State. We're about 21 hospitals. We employ 3,000 doctors. We own a hospice agency, nursing homes, ambulances, home care. 3,000 physicians, 10 billion in revenue. Um, so we're, we're very large, and, and my role in that organization is to really try and push forward uh, these initiatives to help take care of the patients who need it most. And what I want to talk about as we think about the federal opportunities, which are really similar to some of the opportunities we're seeing in the Medicaid market and some of the opportunities we're seeing in the commercial market, I just want to talk a little bit about who's taking advantage of these opportunities and why, and to talk a little bit about do we want that? And, and if we do, great, it's happening. If we don't, then we have some real policy issues that we're going to have to grapple with. And so. So right now, Medicare, as many of you know, is looking to push at least 50% of the dollars they spend into alternate payment models by 2018. Um, and following very swiftly behind are most commercial insurance companies as well as uh, state Medicaid managed care organizations. Now, now, this is really a wonderful thing as a person whose career has been dedicated towards the reduction of suffering for those who are most vulnerable. Um, but I just want to help folks to understand that as we do this, we're creating winners and losers. And we just have to be very open about the winners and losers that we're creating. And so as these policies go forward, who can do this work? Right? And it's really those who can do this work fall into roughly three categories. Large health systems, large, medium to large physician groups, and then what I'll call these sort of third party disruptors who tend to be clinical folks funded by venture capital or funded by um, insurance companies. Um, and those are the three groups that typically can do this work at scale. 
right? Which is really what we're trying to talk about here. Doing this work at scale, taking care of thousands of patients, not you know, tens, twenties, and hundreds of patients. Who can't do this work? Who can't do this work are small physician groups. Okay, they can't do this work, they don't have the infrastructure, and they don't have enough patients so that they won't get financially destroyed if they have a bad year where they have you know, too many expensive patients within this cohort of patients they're trying to take care of. And then it's uh, small community hospitals can't do this for similar reasons. Okay, so, so that's one important thing that I think we need to understand about the realities of as we're pushing to do this work and take on the responsibility for quality and total cost of care for patients with advanced illness, the way in which our policies are set up, it's saying that really those three groups can do it. Now let me get to those three groups. So if you look at large integrated health systems, they're deeply, deeply conflicted about doing this work. And so, and my organization is one of them. We're deeply conflicted about how fast we want to run towards taking care of patients with advanced illness. Large provider groups are not conflicted because they don't own hospitals, right? The, the patients that they're taking care of and the utilization they're trying to reduce is not their revenue, right? So we have to remember that. But they don't really have the, the money or the infrastructure to manage and grow these programs at scale with high reliability. And then you have the third party disruptors um, who aren't conflicted as well and also have a lot of money and don't have the legacies of large organizations that slow them down, okay? Now let me just tell you a little bit of a story about how this plays out financially. So I am involved in a shared savings program for patients with advanced illness. Um, and in, in the year, uh, the first year of our program, we saved $1.65 million uh, taking care of 300 patients. Now that to me is, is magnificent because that $1.65 million is $1.65 million worth of suffering. So we reduced all of that suffering um, and as a result of that suffering reduction, my hospital got a check for $800,000. And I just want to walk through what that actually means to my organization. So $1.65 million, 90% of that was reduction in revenue to my hospital and my hospitals and my subacute rehab facility. So $1.5 million reduction, right, in revenue to my hospital. So I got $800,000 back. So you know, we're still kind of short there. Um, but if you look at that $1.5 million, right, about uh, 750,000 of that, about half of it was direct care costs. So we could probably eliminate that because we didn't have to deliver care, right? So now we're starting to think, oh, maybe this is okay. I got a check for $800,000, I'm missing $750,000 that would have been for profit and to cover costs of other things within my organization. But then you have to remember, it cost me $600,000 to take care of those patients. So this new world of value-based payments, when you're a hospital system, I did the right thing. I kept patients out of the hospital, out of my emergency rooms. I really did a great job, and my hospital system lost a half million dollars doing it, even in the value-based world, okay? Now, if you did that calculation for a large physician group or a third-party disruptor, they're not in the spend, okay? They're not in the spend, and so, that they don't, when you look at the calculation, that same exact population, instead of losing $500,000, they would probably make about $200,000. And so one of the policy recommendations that I think we have to grapple with, because I do believe that the MGH is a wonderful institution, and I do believe that the Brigham and Women's is a wonderful institution, and I do believe that while we may not want them to have as many beds as they currently have, we do actually want them to exist 10 years from now. We have to be thinking very hard about how the shared savings and value-based programs that are being put forth by commercial and federal and state governments are creating winners and losers when you don't take into account where that spend is coming from, okay? Because I would really like for my organization, I would really like for hospital systems, I would really like for integrated delivery systems to run towards advanced illness models as opposed to saying like, well, we'll do a little bit of it but not too much because if we do too much, we'll harm ourselves. So I think that's one policy consideration we really need to think about. I think just a couple more that I wanted to just highlight is that we need to revisit many of our regulations that don't allow for innovation around where patients can get care. 
We've hinted at that a little bit. We also need to look at regulations about what, patient, what people can do in the home. We have a, for example, a paramedic program um, in our health system where we go to patients on nights and weekends. We have a clinical deterioration. Paramedics are wonderful. They carry a pharmacy and they can be there within 23 minutes. Um, the nursing lobbies in our states are, are fighting very aggressively to make sure that we never do that um, because they're worried that it might reduce some home care episodes. So we have to grapple with these things. And then I think the other couple things that we need to grapple with is governments could create order in this space that is sorely needed right now. And where is order needed? Order is needed in places like quality measures. We talked a little bit about it right now. I have to have different quality measures for every relationship that I have with every payer. Right? That's unsustainable. About 10 years ago, there was a great article written that looked at the back office billing of an American hospital versus a Canadian hospital, and it was like 150 back office billers to three in a Canadian hospital. Right? We are soon going to get to that same space with contract management and quality management around contracts that look dissimilar. Okay, and are really often disingenuous in the quality measures that are not quality, but are often just trying re to reduce care. Um, and then the last thing that I will also say is that the federal government needs, or the state government needs to begin to just look at how it is that we transfer information, how we get to manage these populations. Because right now, the secret about the Affordable Care Act is you couldn't have done it in a more expensive way, right? You couldn't have done it in a more expensive way. And what I mean by that is you didn't disintermediate any of the insurance companies, so the insurance money typically still flows through insurance companies who continue to maintain their profit margins and then pass some dollars down to our organizations. And then our organizations have to build infrastructure that's often redundant to the insurance companies. And so what you see at the end of the day is that as you keep taking slice after slice, the amount of dollars that actually goes to medical care is reduced by the way in which we've gone about operationalizing health care reform. So I think we really need to think about these things because there is certainly tons of money being spent on health care. We need to make sure that we're measuring and making sure that most of it is going to the actual delivery of care and not simply the administration of complex contracts. So with that, Excellent. I will stop. Thanks, Chris. And I think that your point um, on the setting is, is critically important in thinking about how we can really support patients, people in the home setting. And that, I think, tees you up perfectly, Bob. Uh, Bob Swislow. Thanks very much, Andrew, and um, thanks very much, Andrew and Tom Kay, for inviting home-based primary care into the continuum discussion. It's been a long time coming. It's viewed as a niche business, but primary care is being embraced by CMS, and I think home-based primary care is starting to become more part of uh, the delivery mechanisms, even for integrated delivery systems. And so with that, I uh, wanted to uh, give you a framework of what we are all about uh, so that we bring context into discussion of some of the policy issues that we're confronting. U.S. Medical Management and Visiting Physicians is a 200 physician group practice based out of Southeast Michigan. Uh, we're also a Centene organization, so we have a health plan that supports us and is very supportive of evolving into home-based primary care. Um, with that, we are the largest home-based primary care organization in the United States. Uh, we have about 35,000 active patients. We will touch about 60,000 people this year and bring longitudinal care into the home. Our medical model is unique in that we bring all manner of ancillary service into the home just in time uh, we also have home health, hospice, palliative medicine, uh, and other kinds of call center activity to help maintain and help the patient uh, age in place. Uh, it's a very expensive model and can't be done under fee for service. So, you know, we have a little bit of uh, enlightened self interest. The shared savings that we've realized in our ACO or the shared savings that we have realized in the first year of independence at home goes to pay for clinical educators to help our physicians with palliative care. Those are the kinds of things that CMMI is bringing into 
health care that we significantly support. And we can get into some of those questions about what CMMI is starting to do for primary care across the country, but we're particularly interested in independence at home. Because of our comprehensive care model, uh, we were successful in getting five of the 17 demonstration sites across the United States. The first year demonstration was tremendously successful. Uh, everybody hit uh, quality performance measures. Four of the 17 sites had 100% of quality measures and the financial success, in addition to patient satisfaction and the quality metrics being in the top quintile, uh, generated $3,000 savings uh, per member per year. Uh, visiting physicians, in fact, had 87% with its five practices of the 17 demonstrations of the shared savings. Again, what did I do with those shared savings? I reinvested. And that's what we're finding most of the other uh, independence at home sites doing at this point in time, reinvesting to build out the care model, which kind of speaks to the rationale of doing this kind of care and taking those assets and redirecting them to things that we don't currently get under fee for service, whether that be palliative medicine, developing educational programs for the patient population. While we will strive to help CMS understand that fee-for-service, really cost accounting, of identifying CPT4 that supports those kinds of things are very important for us to understand resource allocation. The reality is, is we're taking those uh, uh, resources or shared savings and reinvesting into home-based primary care. So I'll leave you with one final note, given the time, that um, we believe that what we've done is we've actually uh, created our own destiny with independence at home. And I will share with you that uh, we had a friends and family day yesterday on the Hill, and that Senator Markey will be introducing conversion legislation around independence at home with both his Democratic and Republican colleagues, and we believe that there is significant bicameral support for that. And so, because I am an advocate, a devout advocate of home-based primary care, we're very supportive of independence at home. Thank you. Uh, Bob, I have a two-part question for you. Um, the first is, we need to talk about the role of advanced care planning in the independence at home model. That's one of the key metrics um, that that uh, you're judged on, uh, advanced care planning, but also the, the critical role I think that hospice plays and the earlier referral to hospice. And um, we haven't talked, I think, enough about the hospice programs and, and the role that they play, but could you remark? Well, we're very fortunate uh, because in our care model, we have hospices across the country in those 14 states, 46 geographies that we take care of. And part of our hospice program is to not only take care of our patients, when they reach that stage, but also to develop a pre-hospice palliative care program that works. Specific to IAH, there is a quality metric that calls for preference and identifying multiple preferences with the patient. And I might call that a code name of advanced care planning, advanced directives, uh, given the kinds of discussions that you have on the Hill sometimes, but just the prevalence of preferences being done immediately when you take that patient on board, uh, we believe is giving very good outcomes to our independence at home results. Excellent. So, but, but you, it's an interesting challenge of hospice in the independence at home demonstration, because one could also make an argument that the independence at home programs, which have a certain uh, level of intensity that is expected of the service model, um, that you could argue that there's a disincentive to enroll patients in hospice because that spend doesn't come. We, we are then responsible for that spend, right? And a, a per diem hospice expense is way more expensive than continuing the independence at home care model until the patient 
expires. And so, you know, again, I think it, it, it can work out, but there's also an incentive if the, if the benefit isn't designed right to actually not want to put patients into hospice. Interesting. Um, Chris, I want to go back to uh, your sort of discussion of your, the care model and mm -hmm. the advanced illness management care model. I think mm -hmm. one thing CTAC has tried to do from the very beginning um, is identify pockets of innovation across the country, including uh, mm -hmm. your health system in mm -hmm. uh, New York. Talk about the, what are the barriers in current law to scaling innovative models of advanced illness management and then sustaining them over mm -hmm. time? I think that's one of the key questions that we look at uh, in terms of federal health policy. And there's actually legislation being introduced this week. Uh, Senator uh, Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island has been looking at what are those barriers at the state level and at the federal level to scaling innovative models of care? So uh, obviously it's, it's workforce, um, and so, um, and you know, I've had the good fortune of working with Brad and Quay on figuring out how to rearrange our workforce so that, uh, that we can scale our work um, easier. But I think that the challenge is that we're living in a gray zone where right now, um, not to pick on home health care, but home health care allows our advanced illness program to exist. But it's not clear if they really took a strong position that we were doing things that ought fall, that is care that should fall under um, a licensed agency or, or a CHA, um, that they could, they could potentially shut our advanced illness program down. And so you know, we'd like to not live in that, that, uh, in that ambiguous space. Um, I think, again, we're similar with our paramedic program. Uh, we think it's delivering great value in keeping patients at home and delivering meaningful clinical response in a timely manner, but it lives in a, in a regulatory gray zone. And then I think the, the final thing, and I've seen this in some of the other shared savings programs that I've been responsible for, is that um, there's the tendency of Medicare, as you extract savings, they move the expected spend, right? And so you don't get credit for uh, managing the patients better than the baseline of three years ago, you're only measured against the improvements that you made. And so eventually you get to a point where you can't sustain these programs because you've taken the savings out and you no longer get credit for them. Questions, we're right up against the hour here, but questions from the audience? Uh, Chris, uh, relative to the three uh, delivery methods at scale and the policies in the federal government around health information technology, mm -hmm. only one of them is actually sort of strategically advantaged right now in terms of health records mm -hmm. and patient-centered care, and that's the, the large uh, provider sector. Mm -hmm. uh, do we need to advocate for patient-centered health records architectures, as some academics have done, in order to move this discussion along? Is it dragging down the kind of other innovation that we've talked about, either from the other two at-scale sectors mm -hmm. or, or in general? So, you know, I, my, my job is to, to overcome the IT limitations of the world. And so I, I, think, that, I think that this work can be done without um, a good interconnected platform. I think it is helped by a good interconnected platform, and I think that the places that I've seen do it well have actually built um, from the ground up their own kind of almost an EMR, um, but it's not meaningful use, you know, certified, um, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. It can drop a bill, uh, but it can't meet some of the some of the the, the the regulations. But fortunately, meaningful use is meaningless in the populations that we're talking about, so there's not a problem there. Um, so I, I don't know what the answer is. I think we're all going to have to battle with it. And uh, I wish that my organization, I could uh, you know, not have to use our enterprise EMR, and I could use something a little lighter and a little more connected. Thank you. I just wanted to thank both of you enormously for the extra layer of detail, which is crucial in talking about cost, because I and other people in this whole field talk about cost savings. But as Chris, as you started to say, and as Bob, you were in, every, every cost saving is someone's lost income. Correct. And unless every time we talk about cost savings, we look at, OK, who's not getting paid as much anymore, and think through that, we will never find solutions. So I want to just thank both of you, uh, and also for showing in your own examples that from a patient person's perspective, 
The real question isn't who's making money, it's how do I maximize the value? That's the winning argument, but we will never succeed if we don't have the level of detail about who's losing money that you guys gave, so thank you. Thank you. We have time for one more question? Uh, Bob, one question for you before we wrap up. Bill talked this morning, I think very eloquently, about the big gap. Um, what people want and what they ultimately get in terms of their health care when, uh, when they're facing advanced illness. Can you talk about how Independence at Home fills or bridges the gap and actually um, addresses some of those serious issues that Bill was talking about this morning? Certainly. I think uh, the hallmark of Independence at Home is team-based care. Um, you're also incented to bring partners to the table uh, to make sure that you're maintaining that patient and aging them in place. Uh, meeting those preferences uh, actually creates an opportunity to help rationalize appropriate care to what the family and the caregivers require of that patient's circumstance. So uh, absolutely team-based care uh, is a hallmark of the program and the quality metrics that we've currently brought to bear are such that uh, they serve uh, the operation uh, very well. Uh, and uh, I think the gap issue is always rationalized with your ability to bring uh, shared savings to the table to do other kind of psychosocial supports, whether it be rents or utilities or other kinds of things that we find our uh, very at-risk population needs. Thank the panel. So that concludes sort of the official portion of today. We've got a lot of things to think about as we um, proceed with the next several years of this collaboration, which we're very excited about. We clearly have our work cut out for us. Um, I will have nothing substantive really to add. I'll leave that to Tom. Um, and I have the fun part of just telling you that we have lunch set up outside. Um, and so after Tom speaks, we can uh, get to know one another a bit better and continue talking um, through some of these ideas that have been presented this morning. Thanks again for everyone's participation. Well, I, I was just actually thinking I have the fun part of this uh, this day because I'm ending this with uh, the easiest part of the agenda, which is to thank everyone for this extraordinary and powerful uh, session today. I think it is really um, a tremendous opportunity in leadership for us to come together and to advocate on behalf of those with advanced illness. Uh, when we started CTAC, our goal and mission was to assure that all Americans, as Bill said uh, at the beginning, uh, have opportunity to receive uh, uh, advanced illness care wherever they reside, uh, wherever they live, uh, to make sure that they have the highest quality, uh, patient-centered, coordinated care that meets their values, goals, and wishes. Uh, we're well on our way with this partnership uh, with the Petrie Flom Center to achieve that mission. And I am just here today, uh, ending this, to thank all of you for participating in this extraordinary an important session. We'll be having more of these as we go on throughout our partnership, and we'll build on what we've learned today, the discussions we've had today, the topics that we need to include that weren't a part of today's discussion as we continue uh, this effort and this initiative. We hope that everyone here today stays inspired and follows us in this journey to transform advanced illness, because the time is right and the time is now. And most importantly, as has been said today, it's right for the patients, the families, and the people we love. We need to make a difference and to make a change, and we're well on our way. I wanted to also just mention um, two things. One, as I said, that we'll be following up with your ideas, and I think there's a form in your packets to uh, give us additional thoughts, additional ideas that we can then build on and follow up in our discussions and our, our sessions. And also, I wanted to mention uh, the SeaTac National Summit, which will be at the National Academy of Sciences uh, on September the 20th and 21st. And we'd all obviously love for all of you to participate. So again, on behalf of my co-chair, Bill Novelli, 
of Holly and Glenn, and of course, Mark Sterling for bringing this opportunity to SeaTac to create this partnership. Uh, thank you. Uh, we continue uh, to look forward to working together to achieve our mission. So with that, we'll conclude and uh, look forward to the next time. Thank you. Thank you.